Here's our 384 well plate that's been sitting on the thermocyclers for a while. Inside this plate are millions of copies of Sanger fragments. There are also millions of lysed E. coli cells and unused reagents. Before we can proceed, we have to separate the Sanger fragments from the other debris in the wells. To isolate the Sanger fragments, carboxyl-covered microscopic magnetic beads suspended in an ethanol solution are added to each well in the plate. In a strong ethanol solution, the carboxyl coating strongly attracts the phosphate backbone of DNA. The carboxyl coating on the beads only sticks to the DNA. All the other bits of cellular debris and reagent remain suspended in solution. Next, a magnet is applied to the bottom of the plate, which draws all the beads and the attached bits of DNA to the bottom of the well. All the other debris is then washed away with an ethanol rinse. The magnet is removed and the excess ethanol is allowed to evaporate. Next, water is added to each well. The water causes the DNA to be released from the bead into solution. A magnet is then applied again to draw the beads toward the bottom. The solution of water and DNA is then drawn off and put into a new plate, leaving the magnetic beads at the bottom of the old plate. What we have here is a 384 well plate with purified DNA and Sanger fragments. This is what we'll load onto the sequencing machine and read tomorrow. Here we are at day five. Let's review what we have done so far. We took the samples you collected and broke them into three kilobase segments. We inserted those segments into plasmids. We inserted the plasmids into E. coli bacteria. We used the bacteria to both duplicate the plasmids and to sort the fragments of DNA that we want to sequence. We then placed each bacterial colony containing a discrete segment of shear DNA into a separate well of these 384 well plates. We then broke open the E. coli bacteria to release the plasmids. We replicated the plasmids using rolling circle amplification. Next, we added fluorescently tagged nucleotide, TAC polymerase, untagged nucleotides, and buffer to the amplified plasmids containing the inserted DNA segments to create Sanger fragments through thermal cycling. Finally, we washed away all the non-DNA material. At this stage, we are actually ready to start reading the sequence of the genetic material. Here we will load the 384 well plate into this ABI 3730 sequencing instrument. Inside this sequencing instrument sits this unit, the capillary array. This array has small glass tubes that are filled with a polymer matrix. This matrix has holes that allows the DNA to migrate through, and based on the fact that DNA has a negative backbone, it will migrate toward the positive anode region. The smaller fragments of DNA will migrate through faster than the larger fragments. As they come across this detection cell, there's a laser that shoots through both the top and the bottom, and it excites the dye terminus on the end of each fragment. This dye terminus then emits a light code back to a CCD camera, and it presents this image that you see here on the screen. This is each of the capillaries, one through 96, and each well is represented by one of these single reads going across the screen. If we look at the screen, we can see the sequence as it is being read. This is a major accomplishment right here. However, we are far from finished. All this raw data needs to be assembled back into the genome of the organism we are sequencing. To do this, we send the data to our assembly team. Here we are at the assembly and quality assessment stage. So far, we have followed a single sample for five days, from raw DNA to Sanger fragments to detection in the capillary sequencer. If you think about what we did to gather this information, you will recognize that there are enormous gaps in the data we've collected from the single DNA strand. Let's take another look. We started out with a strand of DNA that was about 150 to 200 kilobases long. We broke that into three kilobase pieces. In that process, there were some pieces that were too long or too short, so we lost some genetic information there. We inserted the three kilobase pieces into plasmids. Inevitably, some of the pieces were not accepted into a plasmid, so we lost a little information there. Then we inserted the plasmid into bacteria. 
Again, not every plasmid entered a bacterium, and we lose a little information. Finally, if you remember when we were shearing the original DNA strand, I said that current technology allows us to read about 700 bases at a time. Well, if we have a segment that we want to read, which is 3,000 base pairs long, and we read 700 bases from either end, that means that we only read about 1,400 bases of 3,000 base pairs, or roughly half of the target DNA. In the end, we extract less than half of the sequence from the original sample. On top of that, not all the data is 100% accurate. Each nucleotide has a varying degree of probability that it is correct, depending on the strength of the signal in the detector. Besides all the missing data, there is the problem of each segment being out of order. We have the front and back end of thousands of pieces of DNA in a totally random order. By itself, this information is useless. In order to construct a complete genome, we need to take many more samples of the same genome from different cells and create a library. As we sequence progressively more samples, we can start to assemble the genome by finding overlapping portions of the sequence among different segment sequences. Computer programs look for matching sequences of nucleotides and attempt to match them together. This process generally yields the majority of the genome. The advantage of this method is that we are able to sequence the vast majority of the genome relatively quickly and accurately. The disadvantage is that there are always exceptions and quirks in biology that leave gaps and create uncertainties. In the meantime, researchers are able to use the data from the known regions to develop new technologies, cure diseases, and understand the genes that make life possible. Here at the JGI, we are always looking to evaluate and incorporate new technologies. Let's take a look at the next generation of sequencers. This instrument is a genome sequencer flex system from Roche 454 Life Sciences. We have currently evaluated and are incorporating it into our production line. This instrument uses a process called pyrosequencing. Pyrosequencing is a method of DNA sequencing based on the sequencing by synthesis principle, and the method utilizes a chemical light-producing enzymatic reaction for detection. The name comes from the pyrophosphate molecule that is released whenever a nucleotide is incorporated into a DNA strand. The pyrophosphate molecule is then reacted with a series of molecules to create a visible light that is then detected by a CCD sensor. This method of sequencing by synthesis eliminates the need for cloning and picking bacterial colonies. This method can simultaneously sequence 1.6 million samples at a time on a single plate. This eliminates the need to use bacteria and plasmids to sort and amplify the samples and greatly reduces the sequencing process time. Genomics will play a larger role in bioenergy, environmental studies, and preventative medicine in the future. We are happy to have been able to give you a glimpse into what goes on at a sequencing center and hope that the data we generate for you will lead you to new and exciting discoveries.